Hello, and welcome to the Read Me a Bible Story podcast with Pam Baggett and me, Brenda Porch. Today, we're going to read a story that's kind of difficult to tell because there's just so much evil in it. But we know from studying the Bible that God doesn't put in just the good stuff. There's bad stuff, too. And so it begins in Genesis chapter 18. And we read where God sent three men to deliver a message to Abraham and Sarah that they would finally have a baby. But that was not their only job. After they leave Abraham, they're going on their next assignment. They're going to the city of Sodom. Um, Pam, what do you think? This story does not sit well with modern social standards. No. It's not comfortable for anyone. It's not the kind of thing people want to think of God doing. They, they've redesigned God, and he, this doesn't fit his de modern design. But it's the kind of story that we have to remind ourselves of something before we start it. And that is that if we believe the Bible is God's word, then we can't edit out parts that don't fit our comfort level. We have to accept that our creator knows what is best and true, that he knows us better than we know ourselves, and that everything he decides is for our best interests. He decides what's right and wrong, not society or human comfort zones. You know, you, you read stuff like this, and we're about to get into the story a little bit more, but, you know, I've heard people say, oh, God wouldn't send people to hell. Mm -hmm. you no, know, he's a loving God. He wouldn't, he wouldn't do that. Well, hang on to your britches, because it's about to get deep in here. <laughs> that uh, that idea is about to be exploded. So, Pam, we well, need those verses. Well, I'm for you, that's what you just said, Mother, um, we, my brother and I used to love watching our mother whenever Jehovah's Witnesses or other religious groups came to the door. Because <laughs> she knew her Bible and most of our neighbors didn't. And so they kind of got freaked out by us. And so one day she was talking to them and one of them said to her, do you really think a loving father would send his children to hell? And she says, I think a loving father tells the truth. And he says, hell exists. And, we're, and if you don't come to him, you're going there. And the trick is, it's not a matter of him sending us to hell. It's a matter of us not choosing to go with him. Right, because he's he's holding out his hand and showing us how to get there. If we don't choose to follow him, we're not getting there. Yeah, he doesn't send us. We pick where we go. Mm -hmm. we that's the that's a reality. We, we don't want reality. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get All into right. Genesis eighteen. All right, verses sixteen and nineteen. Then the men set out from there, and they looked down toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to set them on their way. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation? And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Okay, the relationship of God and Abraham is so unique. Mm -hmm. More than once in the Bible, Abraham is called the friend of God. I think that's so cool. <laughs> I want that title. I want that relationship. Well, James no. 2, 23 says, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. That friendship moved God to tell Abraham about his plans. You know, when I hear those verses read as you were reading them, you know, I'm, I'm struck by what really feels like respect that um, God had for Abraham and Abraham had for God. There was a sort of a mutual friendship there. And mm -hmm. I think that's really, that's kind of neat that God would say, you know, I'm fixing to do something and am I going to hide it from Abraham? Because he's going to be a mighty nation. So scripture gives us an insight into what God was thinking at the time when he made these decisions. And I, I think that's, I think that's kind of neat. So let's keep going so we can find out what happens next. In verses 20 through 22, it says, Then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done all together according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. So the men turned from, from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood before the Lord. So God's explaining to Abraham just what he plans on doing. Now, I find a couple of things here really interesting. First is that God is explaining in detail why he's sending these men down to Sodom. And then the second thing is he says, he wants to know if the sins happening there are truly as bad as the outcry claims them to be. In other words, God is saying, you know, I've heard just how sinful these people were. So 
I'm going to send somebody down here to investigate, look into this and see how accurate these reports are. Now we are, we know that God knows everything. He already knew how sinful those people were. So let, let's not be misled by the wording here. Um, he's just explaining it that way so that Abraham can understand it. It was for Abraham's benefit. Um, you know, we know that Abraham's nephew lived there, Lot lived there. And so whatever happens to that city is going to impact relatives of Abraham. And so, you know, I just think if, if um, Lot and his family had been killed too, uh, th I mean, that's that's possible that, you, that God would go in and destroy the whole city and that Lot and his family would have been killed too. But, you know, what's your take on all this, Pam? What do you think? Well, we know God does know everything. That's not a question, but it may be kind of like a parent with a young child and you can, I can see on my phone, I know what you're doing, but I'm going to turn my attention to them so they see me and know I'm connected with what they're doing. I've got, I've made the effort to know it. So it may be the parent child thing again, God's saying, okay, I'm going down. So, you know, make sure that you're really as bad as I know you are. So he, he's got to send someone to stop him for that. But he. It's all logical. God knows everything, but he shows respect for Abraham and for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, and for Lot. And Lot being there could have shared some of what he knows about God with these people. Mm -hmm. So they had a chance to know that there was a God and that there's a different way to live because Lot would certainly not have lived the way they did. Obviously, he didn't from the way he behaved today in mm -hmm. the story that we're about to read. Um, they all needed to know that God was not being vindictive toward the sinful people in those cities. They needed to understand how bad things really were. Lot had been living among these people. He knew what they were capable of doing, but he had found some way to tolerate their behavior in order to live there. He's going to have his eyes opened in a dramatic way. But first, God and Abraham are going to work through some issues. What was this? <laughs> Genesis 18, 23 to 25. Then Abraham drew near and said, will you indeed sweep away all the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Would you then sweep away the place and not spare it for those 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous um, fare as the wicked do. For be that for, Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? Okay, he's playing such, <laughs> such a tacky little game. If this was a child talking to me, you know, as a parent, I would say, yeah, you're so cute. No, we're going to do this my way. <laughs> you're cute but this is it um so their relationship though had to be close for abraham to speak to god like this yeah absolutely abraham is judging god's decision and counseling him about it now, i grew up in a jewish community and yiddish was spoken by everyone i knew there and there is a word in yiddish for what abraham is showing us chutzpah basically it means having a lot of nerve the definition of the word in the joys of yiddish which is kind of like a dictionary is an anecdote where a man murders his parents and then throws himself on the mercy of the court because he's now an orphan. <laughs> it takes chutzpah. You don't do that without chutzpah. And this is what Abraham's got. He's, he's demonstrating it. Yeah. I, you know, I'm listening to that and I'm thinking, wow, Abraham is actually kind of bargaining, arguing with God. Um, you know, he's saying, look, look, Lord, and, and almost chastising God in the way he said it is like, you know, would you really, would you really go in and do these things if, you know, even 50 uh, righteous people could be found? And I thought, you know, as I'm reading that, I'm thinking Abraham must have felt comfortable and thought that it would be okay. And, you know, if God had struck him right then and there, he'd have had every right for being so um, disrespectful in a lot of ways, questioning the bear. what he did, but um, that's not what happened. He was poking the bear. <laughs> he was definitely poking the bear. <laughs> uh, and, and we kind of saw that with Moses. When when Moses convinced God not to destroy the people because they'd sinned so greatly worshiping the idol while Moses was on the mountain talking to God. And we find that in Exodus 32, 14. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. So I find that so interesting that God had a relationship with certain individuals that there was so close that when they questioned him, he was willing to, to change his mind, so to speak, and to do something different. And, and I, I'd like to think that 
it's that way for all of us, you know, that when we go to God and we, we petition on for ourselves or for other people, that God is going to hear those prayers and he's going to consider our request. But I think we better be respectful and obedient when we're doing those things, don't you? Well, I've learned that it's okay to tell God what we really feel, even if we're angry at him. Mm -hmm. As long as we're willing to be still and know that he's God when we're through, sometimes we hear him better after we've poured out all of our feelings to his, into his ear. No, I've, I've talked to ladies about that. That's one of those things that I say quite often. It's like, wait a minute, you're holding all this inside because you don't want God to know how you're feeling. <laughs> like, really? He's God. He already knows. But when we say it, there's a process that we go through to organize it. And I, it gets it out there for us to look at and for us to admit that we're struggling in a certain, in a certain area. And so I, I'm all about being honest with God because he's not going to be surprised. <laughs> we don't really hear that well when our emotions are too strong. Yeah. When, when they're taking over everything, we don't hear him, but there's a quiet that comes in our spirit. Once we've dumped out everything into a, a God that listens to us. You know, I hadn't really thought about it that way, but I think you're right. Um, sometimes I just need to be able to say out loud what I'm thinking and feeling. Mm -hmm. And just doing that does sort of settle things down and get you to a point where you can really look at it and think, all right, you know, I'm going to accept whatever God says. I've had my say. Um, and it's, it's an important thing to do. You can breathe and listen. Yeah. It just changes everything physically and emotionally. Hmm, that's true. I had not, you're so wise. Oh, goodness. <laughs> All right. I've done everything wrong. So I learn everything right. That's uh, well, you know, that's what I say. People tell me, oh, you're so smart. I'm like, it's only because I've been in all the pit hole, pitfalls and the, and the holes that I've dug myself into that I can tell you where they are. Not yeah. that I saw them ahead of time is like, I've been exactly. there. I've yeah. made that mistake. Yep. And I made that one and I made that one and I made that one. Totally. <laughs> so, um, yes. I think that's how, as we get older, we become more wise, not that we gain anything intelligence wise or IQ wise. It's just experience. And there's nothing like um, having made that mistake that makes you want to warn other people. Don't do that. It doesn't, it doesn't go well. All right, so let's see what happens. So Abraham, sorry, say Adam. Abraham has challenged God. If you find just 50 righteous people, you wouldn't destroy the city now, would you, God? Let's see what God says. Genesis 18, 23, 26 through 33. And the Lord said, if I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. And Abraham answered and said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. I am whom but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the 50 righteous are lacking. We destroy the whole city for lack of five. And he said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. Again, he spoke to him and said, suppose 40 are found there. Oh man, talking about bargainer. <laughs> It'd be great at a flea market. And he answered for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose 30 are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. And he answered, For the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Man, this is a long-suffering God. I mean, he is just being so kind to Abraham. Then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. <laughs> now he knows this on thin ice. And I will speak again, but this once. Suppose 10 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he finished speaking to Abraham. And Abraham returned to his place. Wow. They started out with 50 and he bargained he bargained and pleaded and talked to God into going all the way down to 10 people. I just, you know, when you read things like that, 
what sticks out in my mind is how gracious mm -hmm. and loving God was to him at that point. God knew that there weren't 10 people there. I mean, he knew, but he, he went along for the sake of Abraham. That's my humble opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and he just, he kept bargaining. Abraham kept bargaining until they got down to 10. And then God left. <laughs> it's like, this is the end of the discussion. I'm going to do what I need to do now. Um, I just, I just have a hard, I guess there wasn't the communication we have today. I just kind of find it hard to, to think about Lot living in a place, not really that far from Abraham and it being so wicked. And, and yet Abraham still holds out hope, I, I guess, but man, that he, he was, he was, he was brave. He was brave talking to God that way. Yeah, chutzpah and skillful, skillful negotiating. Yes. It does seem Abraham hasn't visited Lot in his new city, mm -hmm. but it would have been more natural for the younger kinsman to make the trip to visit than the older one. Mm -hmm. But no matter what he knew about the place, Abraham obviously wanted to save his family. He stopped negotiating at 8 and 10, which would have been enough to cover Lot, his family, and potential son-in-laws. Mm -hmm. He had it figured out. All right, chapter 19, verses 1 to 3. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth and said, My lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, No, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly so that they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Okay, there weren't a lot of motels in that time. <laughs> if folks traveled in those days, they would often be going to visit family and would assume they could stay with them. If they did not have family when they stopped in a city for the night, staying in the town square would have been the option unless someone offered them hospitality. And Lot was a hospitable person, but he also knew his neighbors. Yeah, yeah. You know, what I'm struck about this, though, is that we're told that these are angels. And evidently Lot knew there was something special about them because of the way he bowed down to them, the way he addressed them, he called them lords. Um, and I know, like you're saying, it was a custom of the day to take in travelers, but I have to wonder if another reason Lot offered them shelter was that he knew that the danger that they would face if they stayed in the town square. Because I guess if you're staying in the square, you're sleeping out in the open. And so you've got no protection from anything. And so I just find this interesting that this is one of the few times that I can think of that scripture talks about an angel appearing to someone and they don't hit the ground trembling. You know, he, he, he knew they were special, but he wasn't obviously was not completely afraid. They, he, they may have not presented as angels. We don't know that for sure, but it's probably a safe bet to say they would look really different from the people that live in that city. Mm -hmm. Um, people that are living in that much sin would probably not be maybe clean, maybe um, th there could have been a lot of difference in their attitude and their behavior and their posture and everything. And these angels would have been perfect in appearance and in clothing and everything else. They may have just presented as someone who definitely would not have fit in with the city people and their way of life. And so he just recognized someone like himself or someone that he would identify with and said, okay, you need to be safe. So you come on in. Yeah, so and they, you know, maybe they were, like you said, maybe they were really well dressed and he was calling them that out of respect, thinking that they had a position of power. You know, maybe they were important people. Maybe they had on, I mean, we're guessing, but and there was are. something, there yeah. was something there that told Lot that these two men need to come home with him. Mm -hmm. um, Could have been even God telling him that, but we can figure he might have just seen something he could identify with too. He's not identifying with his neighbors. He's not he's not a person like them, so he's probably not identifying with their with the people that he's staying with and living with. So seeing someone very different and more like what he would expect in terms of values, there's there's all kinds of reasons he might have invited them in. We don't know, or God just may have been saying, "Hey, you do this." Yeah, and God set up. We yeah. just don't know. But angels would have been attractive men, and they might have seemed to be their appearance may have made them seem like a special risk for sleeping in the public area. That's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just, you know, I look at this story and I think, 
how in the world did Lot live in the midst of this mess and depravity uh, that we're going to get into later, but, and, and not pack his bags and leave. And then I look at the U S and I look at the way we're going and uh, you know, the things that over time we have accepted and um, just, just, you know, of course, you know, I'm a big, big one on the sexual uh, I am too. mess that the world is in right now. But, um, you know, he didn't, he didn't pick up his family and leave. He stayed there. And but but yet we, we, we stayed here, you know, we don't boycott uh, companies or public figures or, uh, you know, a product um, because we know that they're backed by something evil. Actually, I do kind of. But... There's a few people that do, but for the most part, no. um, we're you know, tolerating we're our children them. being taught about genders and that there aren't any that, right. or there's so many. Uh, we're, they're being taught, you know, you seem to be a boy, but you might be a girl. We're being taught, they're being taught all kinds of concepts and values that we know are sinful and wrong. So where do we run with that now? It seems like it's pervasive. Well, you know, there's what, 26 letters in the alphabet? I never remember if it's 24 or 26. One of those. Um, What? 26. 26. Okay, good. I got it right the first time. Uh, I saw a little thing on social media the other day. Uh, A lady was showing a book that her child had brought home from the library, uh, elementary, and it was the ABCs of gender. Oy. Every single letter, there was a different oh. gender. And even when it was like, you know, male, it's like they're a male, but they might decide later they're not a male or whatever. Oh. It was it was bizarre. I mean, some of the, I've never heard, they had words that start with a Q that has to do with gender. I mean, it was like, could you be more confusing to a child? Mm-hmm. You know, right. Not, not just confused. to say that there's, two genders but now we've got 26 well, something i told the other, heard the other day is over 100 they've got so many different things but the thing is we don't we can't leave we can't go somewhere else where would we go you know and i don't know if lot felt like he was in that position or not but it we can look at him and wonder how he did it but i'm wondering how we're doing it today yeah true true all right so we're gonna stop right here because um Time is getting a little short, but I'm, before we do, I'm going to go over the, um, the the things that we can learn from this portion of it. But you want to tune in next time because um, the night has just begun. Taking these men home is not going to take care of the whole problem. So you need to tune in next time and listen. Well, somehow there's a comment made by a Betty Davis film character in my mind. She said, fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy ride. yeah it's definitely going to be a bumpy ride all right the first thing that i saw is that god cares and he listens he listened to the cry of people about sodom he listened to abraham as he pleaded for the salvation of at least some of the people and he listens to us when we pray and you know we read two accounts of god changing his mind because of a conversation with a faithful follower our prayers have an impact on God. He loves us and he really listens. And this is one of my favorite verses, especially when I'm going through difficult times. It's James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you might be healed. This is my favorite part. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And I think the King James has something like avails much. Mm-hmm. Um, and there is power in prayer, ladies. So if you're struggling with something, get as many faithful Christians to pray about it as you can, because God listens. We're not just talking to the ceiling. He listens. Then the next thing that we're going to find out is that uh, God will judge the wicked. Um, right now, it seems like the bad guys are getting away with everything and Everybody's being hurt by this sin, but judgment day is going to come and it's going to come for Sodom and Gomorrah pretty soon. And they don't have to wait till the end of time, but it, you know, as we go through this, all we can do is love one another. If we know someone that's living in sin, we still love them and we still want to help them and we still want to teach them the right way to go. 
but God will judge the wicked. You know, we talked earlier about God would not send, uh, you know, people to hell, but um, according to the scripture, there will be a heaven and there will be a hell and a lot more people are going to hell than heaven. And that's very sobering. And so right now we know that there are men that are going to go stay at Lot's house, but um, the word's going to get out. And so some serious things are going to happen. This is true. Uh, and then the last thing that I saw is that God gives us the opportunity to show who we really are. And, you know, in other, in, in scripture, it talks about entertaining angels unaware and you know we talked earlier about whether or not Locke actually knew that these were angels and you know we don't know we just know that he he wanted them to come home with him Hebrews 13 2 says do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers for thereby some have entertained angels unawares and I love that I think about that a lot and whenever you have the opportunity to do something nice for someone else that you don't know, you'll never see again. Um, I think that's God giving us the opportunity to possibly be entertaining an angel to, to do something nice for an angel. So maybe it was that um, stranger you were kind to, or the lady you helped with your luggage or the beggar on the street or the one, you know, standing on the side of the road and you roll down your car we don't know. Lot had two angels in his home and we have no indication that he knew that they were angels, but he treated them with kindness and hospitality. And I'm not suggesting that we need to go out into the street and take people into our homes. This is a new, this is a different world now. Um, and maybe their homes were set up and I don't know, and, but that's what everybody had to do. But we just need to think about every stranger we come in contact with might be an angel. We, we just don't know. And so everybody that we run into, every everyone that we spend time with, especially strangers, we need to treat with love and, and generosity and kindness because no matter who we are or what we have, we can use that for the glory of God. And he gave it to us in the first place. And so it's just wonderful when we can use it for the Lord. So I just sitting here thinking, have you ever had a situation where you thought maybe you had entertained an angel? Every foster child I took in. Hmm. Good point. Good point. I, um, I think I've told this story before where my, I had two small children um, and uh, like under the age of six and went to the gas station and saw this young lady, looked like she was in her early 20s, with her hood up. And her, there was oil all on the inside of her, her car, under her hood. And she's just standing there looking at it. And she, you know, several guys came over, you know, to offer her help. And she, you know, she turned them down. And then she goes into the, into the store, and, you know, to... Um, talked to the manager and I overheard her saying that the, her boyfriend had changed the oil in her car the day before and he did not put the oil cap back on. And so as she was driving down the road, that engine was just spewing oil everywhere. Could have been so dangerous. Yes. Oh. And I, you know, I, several gentlemen were really interested in helping this beautiful young girl, <laughs> But um, I, when I offered, she jumped at the chance. I thought that was very wise of her. Not only was I a woman, but I was a woman with small children. Yeah. And so I took her to my house and we, you know, my husband being a mechanic, we knew where all the auto parts places were. We had all the phone numbers. We finally found the right gas cap and got it for, and, you know, got the right oil and got it back, got her back on her way. Um and I wondered as she drove out, you know, I wonder if she was an angel. Of course, her mom um, sent me an email or called me. I think she called me um, like the next day or a couple of days later to thank me. And so I thought, well, I guess she wasn't an angel because her mom called me. <laughs> but well, I just like cool. to think that, you know, if my daughters were ever or my son were ever in a situation where they really needed help, that someone would help them. Mm -hmm. So lots doing his best to protect his guests, but 
it's going to get ugly, folks. So you oh, need yes. to come back. So ugly. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Pam, I think I've said all I need to say. Did you have any ending comments before we go? No, just buckle up. Buckle up. Yeah. Um, come back because if you don't know this story, it, it's going to raise an eyebrow or two. We yeah. hope you come back and join us again. We love doing these Bible studies with you. And I love studying with my friend Pam. And uh, God's word is just so wonderful. And we appreciate you being here. And we hope you'll tell your female friends about it and, and join us again. This is an easy, fun way to study the word of God. So have a blessed day and we'll see you next time.